What we really want to focus on today is both businesses and technologies, right, that are smaller in stature, um, but not short on importance, features, reliability, throughput, or flexibility. Nothing that you see in this layout is truly entry level in my, in my opinion, right? When I say entry level, meaning um, something that's in the garage or the pole barn that we're going to run a couple hours a week, right? That's kind of entry level to me. This is all, I say, uh, commercial level technology, meaning if you say my business is my livelihood, right? The quality of the product and my reputation are important. And what I'm investing in, regardless of the size of my shop or the number of people that work in it, it needs to run, it needs to produce good parts in order to keep my, right, my revenue coming in, feed my family and feed my employees' families. Dave, as I look at this layout here, I see where it looks like we have almost two small manufacturers kind of together here. Well, Terry, you know, with a system like this, we're, we are showing a blended system. Um, it can be split up into two ways. Basically, we can talk about cut band bore, the typical panel saw, vertical machining center, and edge bander. And then the second path would be nesting, edge bander, and then an ABD dowel insertion machine. So there are two, two paths here, but we're going to show these as they're blended together. One of the comments that I'm sure many participants are thinking here, right, in terms of that floor space, that's great, guys, but where does my product go? right? There's not much space in between machines. It's not showing here in the display, but uh, prior uh, pre-banding, we placed the cut components on a small table here on the end feet of the bander, a uh, small table on the end feet of the vertical drilling machine, and on the out feet of the drilling machine. And those are just buffer places. So instead of having lots of carts traveling around or lots of conveyor here movement, we tried to really limit the amount of uh, space that we're occupying here to get really efficient. It really, it's it's designed like that on purpose, right? Limited amount of work in progress because we're all in this not to build product, but to ship it, bill for it, get paid for it. So typical cut band bore, uh, the raw goods are, are delivered to a panel saw over on a scissor lift, for example, use scissor lifts so that uh, the operator, just for ergonomics, operators not bending uh, down to the ground, trying to lift up and, man and uh, handle heavy sheets of material. That way can slide the material right onto the air tables of the panel saw. The panel saw, uh, we can use a 100, 130 or 200 series saw here for a system like this. Um, it's going to be cutting one to two sheets at a time. It has uh, IntelliGuide Basic, which is an LED light system across the uh, front of the pressure beam. It's going to guide the operator on where to place the panel, what orientation to place the panel. And we're able to do all of our ripping and cross cutting on a saw like this. So we have high quality parts, scoring saws there for good edge on the bottom as well. And what's important as, as we're passing the blade through the part when we're ripping and then we do our uh, cross cutting and we finish cutting that part, as the blade's passing through, we can produce a label uh, on that, on the, off the saw on a manual label printer. They peel that label off and apply it to each one of the parts. And that label can have all kinds of information on there. For, we can talk about sorting. We can have an image of what the finished part looks like, edge banding details, barcodes for secondary processes. So lots of information is passed along after we produce the parts on the panel saw. And then from the saw, typically we go over to the bander. What, what are we using for a bander in a system like this, Terry? Yeah, this will be our S200 uh, range. And, and with what this is going to be, it's going to be more of a, a smaller footprint. Uh, the footprint itself is going to be anywhere from 12 uh, to 15 feet. Um, you're going to have you know, some automation and some uh, manual adjustments in this particular range. HOMAG has been around for 60 years, right? And then they've been manufacturing edge banders for 60 years now. And you, you hear automation and, and that's with what customers need. That's with what customers want. But to keep us in a range that will allow us to have these smaller footprints and, and add some of this uh, with what I reference as a manual adjustment, we're talking like the infeed fence, right? The infeed fence, we're going to uh, just use a wrench to use the, the upper pressure belt or rollers, we're going to lift that up. Rather than going to the controls, we can just do that with a wrench. 
What are we using for the adhesion of the banding to the board on a on a bander like this? This particular configuration, we we have the range of uh, EVA. Uh, we have AirTech now available. That's uh, that's actually fairly new to our our lineup. Um, so we have both capabilities as, as well as PUR. So that, that's new to uh, this particular lineup. And what it does is it allows uh, people with it that small footprint uh, to be able to have that zero edge technology, that air tech uh, technology. What, what were the things that were scaring people away from air tech for a long time? What are what were the, some of the discouragers and how have things changed to where now it's, you know, now it's more feasible and accepted in the market? Well, I mean, when you're dealing with any new technology, there's always th that uh, that scare. I mean, you're also talking about uh, edge banding. Edge banding uh, is a different type of edge banding when you're talking EVA or PUR EVA or AirTech. So the edge banding, there was this misconception that uh, to make out a cabinet, right, to edge a cabinet, it was going to cost you a lot more because of the edge banding, where I think before it was – you would do the calculation as you purchase this edge banding, and the edge banding was much cheaper. PUR, cheap, but this AirTech banding was expensive. But when you truly calculate everything out, it doesn't add much to that case. A $30 increase for like an entire kitchen, so it adds very little uh, cost to it. Uh, I believe we added uh, an air table at the end of this uh, bander so that uh that way the operator can is acts as a little bit of a buffering there so they can send the parts down through a system like this instead of traversing back and forth across the face of the bander we're able to put four or five parts through a system like this collect them and then return them for second and third uh passes normally you wouldn't see like a return conveyor um on a bander at this size you would just use that to like you said air table or some form of table and the operator would uh send a few parts through the the machine and uh, get the parts and turn them around we wouldn't use a, a return conveyor in this range on a system like this we run this as a single operator a single operator run the panel saw the vertical machining center and the bander so this is actually a two-person operation on this size cut band bore type of cutting to where one machine operator and one in construction. And this fits in about 900 square feet, uh, almost 1,000 square feet on a system like this. And we're constructing cabinets at a rate. Uh, the construction uh, we're building out every six and a half to seven minutes is a completed uh, cabinet assembly. That's uh, doors on, drawers in shelves and shelf clips hinges and so forth so this that's the pace with which you run at on a two-person system uh like this and then off after the bander after the edge banding is applied then uh, we're going down here to the vertical machining center what are we using for a vertical machining center here james the drill tech v200 right um this is an alternate to a traditional pot and reel based machining center right so a traditional pot and reel machine very functional um, has the ability to drill vertically horizontally uh, groove with a groove blade or a groove saw plus route and shape parts um, the downside there was um, as as quantities or batch sizes got smaller right the time associated with moving rails and setting up pods to to machine a handful of parts, right? You spend more time setting up the machine than you did drilling and, and shaping the parts. And that's where these, these vertical machining centers come, come into play. There's zero setup alternatives to a traditional pod and rail machine. So that's the cut band bore version uh, type of processing. But then we're able to take and segment this out into that uh, NESA base path. So what's that, what's that path look like there, James? So we go from cut band bore where we're using the saw to make big rectangles smaller rectangles then uh, vertically drill and shape right for your your 32 millimeter system holes and your you know your pilot holes for your screws or your eight millimeter construction holes depending upon what your construction method is if we take that into a, a nested base uh, part flow right your router uh, is a three in one right vertical drilling uh, making bigger bigger rectangles, smaller rectangles, as well as your shaping, whether it's a simple toe notch or maybe we're doing something else within the within the day for production. It's it's not simple or it's not, I don't want to say simple, it's not traditional cabinets. 
Um, maybe it's countertops or it's store fixture work or it's reception desk where those parts are not square, right? And they're shaped. All of that happens with, again, going back to that zero setup philosophy on the nested base machine. Uh, raw board in, finished parts out with very little physical setup of, of the router. We talked about the Nessa base router. We talked about the banding. What are we doing for down insertion in a solution like this? I think it's important to understand what the machines do, right? So drill a hole and, and insert a wooden peg, pretty simple. Um, but if we're, you know, we don't have in-feed automation, we're, we're basically carting parts here. Uh, in a layout like this, a drill and dial machine will sit for about 40% of the day, not running parts, but not broken, meaning um, you have operator handling time. Um, you have time to load programs to the machine. You have times to move parts from one end of the machine to the other if we're uh, dialing more than one end. Um, the operator has to cart the parts. If the next batch of parts isn't quite ready, um, we've got to wait for that next cart of parts to come up. And as David mentioned earlier on the cut band bore side, often one operator runs the saw, the edge bander, and uh, the vertical machining center. The same thing can happen here, understanding that there are downtimes for these machines in a, in a smaller to a moderate volume segment. With a system like this, uh, anytime we're linking machines, we're passing data through there, there's lots of information we need to know, right? Uh, as far as all the assemblies, um, all the cabinets or components, usually we're uh, aden identifying them individually because here in systems like this, typically we're not doing high volumes of any single piece or product. We're flowing through a little more dynamic, a lots of, lot more variables, a lot of different sizes and colors and shapes. So with a system like this, we definitely need to drive it with a, on a digital side of things. We have what's called IntelliDivide and IntelliNest. So with these two systems, um, what happens is, is we, you actually create a spreadsheet, you upload a spreadsheet, and we generate the, the patterns that are to be cut with certain information to be passed onto the labels. And as well, typically you're developing a part in a, a CAD system of some, some sort, and you take that CAD of that part, we can upload that up, and then until a nest, we'll take and generate the nests um, to be produced on the CNCs. On the CNC side of things, we can take things into consideration like common line routing, where we're using the same router bit to split two different parts, so we're not uh, making two separate paths. Uh, we can optimize the drilling, so instead of pecking one hole at a time, we know the configuration of the machining centers, and we're able to uh, drill most efficiently as possible, or route as most efficiently as possible. So, definitely, software is a is a driver of a system like this. I love the fact that systems like this can grow with our customers as their market changes. Because what they produce now, three years from now, five years from now, it's always changing, and uh, we can future proof them with a system like this. As vendors and suppliers into this industry, we are always looking for avenues to grow our customers, right? We want them to grow as much as they want to grow themselves. But I, we sometimes trap ourselves in, right, to grow a customer. We have to have new buildings and more floor space and more headcounts and in bigger shops, right? And that's not always the case. So the footprint is small, so we can fit into uh, a lot of uh, compact areas and then like you mentioned earlier you know this many times these systems are going into large manufacturing as well to where we're running all of our prototype work we're running our uh, talls and custom things through a, a system like that to allow the mainstream production the higher volume larger systems to run and do what it does best and not have to slow down for these custom things and things that aren't ideal to run through those particular layouts. Absolutely. The epitome of flexibility in small floor, in a smaller floor space environment, it, it doesn't have to be only cut bamboo or only nested base manufacturing. That ability to have uh, the ability to do both really brings really an unmatched level of flexibility into the shop. <laughs>